Hey moms, welcome to the Gather Moms podcast. My name is Kate. And I'm Rebecca. We've created this space just for you because we're both moms and we get you. Yes, we believe there truly ain't no hood like the motherhood and we need to be in this together. We also believe we can't mom well without Jesus. So you're going to hear us talk about him too. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Gather Moms and make sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. All right, mamas, let's jump in. Hey moms, welcome to the Gather Moms podcast where we're taking all season long to talk about home. And last episode, Rebecca took us to the kitchen. I love the kitchen. And gave a little talking to to that control freak that lives in all of us. Listen, I loaded the dishwasher this morning and as I was loading, I was thinking about my <laughs> little system for how to make it all fit just right. Yeah, I've been more aware of, you know, what I'm getting on to my kids about and trying to give a little more grace and encouragement. Lots of praise. Yes, that was good for us. So I feel like we need to stay in the kitchen for one more episode to talk about something else that goes on in there. And it's the whole reason for the need to clean, the dishwasher issues, and the oven that smokes in Rebecca's house every time she cooks (laughs) because that girl just won't clean it. Listen, I just don't have time for that. I need somebody (laughs) to do it for me. I don't want to. Plus, I don't really know how. I okay. I don't think I've ever done it. Listen, moms, I put together, we've got a whole reel coming out for the steps to clean yes. your oven. I'm going to do it this summer. I'm going to so do it. It's going to be the Rebecca challenge to clean that oven. She's lived there 15 years. That's right. And we have not cleaned that oven no, yet. No, we haven't. <laughs> I mean, I just deal with like when I cook a pizza that it's going to melt onto the oven. And <laughs> you smell 15 years of past dinners. Probably so. <laughs> Probably so. Yes. So that may not want anybody to come to my house to eat dinner there because they're nervous. No, I think it's fantastic. I'm just giving you a hard time. But so all those things, the reason for the cleaning up, the reason for the smells in the oven is the food. Shout out. Love me some food. Me too. And the food is the reason for all that mess, right? It's like that punishment that we get. You're like, man, I'm cooking from home. And then you're like, dang, this is so much work. It's so much work. You cook for so long, you eat for 10 minutes, and then you clean up for so long. Yeah. What are we doing? Yes, I know. Let's go out. Exactly. It can be a real, it can be a real kick in the pants. So the food is the reason for all the mess. And for a lot of us, including me, food can be the reason I get into some other messes. So today I want us to get real about the food in our homes, our culture around food, the messages we're sending and believing about how to live in a healthy way, physically, mentally, and spiritually with food. Let's do it. All right. So we're just going to do a deep dive into what could be a pretty sensitive topic. Um, But I think that's something that's prevalent in all of our homes. For sure. For sure. Good for us to talk about. So I want us to start by looking back at our own our own childhoods and how we interpreted messages about food at a young age. And let me say this caveat. I personally received some unhealthy messages. And I want our listeners to know as I share that, that I know my parents were doing the very best that they could with what they had, and I want to honor their growth in that, Yes, as well as being able to honor our own experiences, right? Right. Because we need to be able to tell our truth. And I remember going to my mom, you know, when I started having a chance to speak and teach to women, and there were times where I've said, I need to tell this story or that story, and she said, Kate, you tell your truth. And that was so freeing for so me. So freeing, And yes. so I hope that can be something that we say to our kids someday. Um, but that's a message I received, you know, from my parents is I get to tell my truth. And so that's what we're going to do here today. Okay, like I kind of just it caught in my throat for a second. I was like, oh my gosh, my kids are going to tell their truth one day. What are they going <laughs> to say about me? Oh, well, that's the thing, you know, I mean, I'm sure there'll be pr- plenty of wonderful things, but you know, there oh, are, there's going to be some rough stuff too. Right? Come on. And that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Because we would be doing them a disservice if we were the perfect parents because no one's ever going to be able to live up Okay. To that. So let me tell this quick story. Yeah. So we had Beth Moore speak at our church. I was just thinking about that. And she said that yeah. she said that to be a perfect parent is an unrealistic expectation for your kids it would yeah. actually put a burden on, on them yes. that they would have to do it one day so that night it was Saturday that she spoke and my family went and it was the day before Mother's Day uh-huh. and my husband had the kids sign my Mother's Day card that night uh-huh. so my middle child wrote in the Mother's Day card happy Mother's Day I'm so glad you're not perfect 
precious boy. So, he had listened. Okay, so let me tell you, I was sitting behind you guys, and I saw him when she said that. He leaned over and, like, kind of gave you a little snuggle. Yes. And then he leaned over to his dad and gave him a little snuggle, and dad put his arm around him. And I was like, that precious middle kid. Yes. You know? No, he knows it. And he, I was so thankful because he embraces me still. Yes. Even despite my imperfections. That's so comforting yes. and good. I'm, I told him, I said, dude, I'm keeping that. That's coming out Christmas in 20 years we're gonna talk about this mother's day card for the rest of your life i love it i love it i think that's a beautiful thing okay so rebecca let's start with you i want to throw it back to your family and how you guys treated food and talked about food growing up so tell me did y'all eat all your meals together did someone cook breakfast every morning were any foods not allowed what was it like So when I look back at my journey with food as a child, I feel like I don't have any memories because it was very normal in our house. Okay. My mom cooked dinner every night. We ate together as a family. Okay. A lot. I don't know what we had for breakfast. I remember I got to drink sodas all the time. You did? (laughs) Yes. Okay. That was like my afternoon snack. I would come home and have a soda. Um, we loved food in our house. There were not any foods that were off limits. We ate a lot of hamburger meat. Yeah. I mean, that was the go-to yeah. dinner. Um, I really had a great growing up experience with food. It was, it was in my mind, there was nothing to really talk about because it wasn't a big deal in our house. Wow. That is so awesome. And were you guys, did, did mama Judy, was she making dessert every night? Or? That I don't remember. My mom is a great cook. Uh huh. Like my kids will tell me even now, can grandma make that uh-huh. for us? Cause <laughs> they think she makes it better. So she's a great cook and we had really good food. I mean, all the yummy things. So I remember lots of great meals. Desserts, yes. I mean, I just, we didn't go out to eat a ton. I think we did on Sundays after church. But okay. I don't know. I feel like I grew up in that era where you just ate at home yeah. a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, you know, I think we ate at home more than my family does now, Oh, for too. sure. Yeah? For sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember we would go, and I always thought it was Whataburger, but when yes. we got to go to Whataburger, that was know, a big deal. It was a big deal. Yes. I think big ours deal. was Dairy Queen. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We ate outside, but I feel like my family, I feel like we eat to go more than, than I did growing oh, up. Oh my goodness. Bless yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So my home food experience was pretty different. <laughs> <laughs> so we were on our own for breakfast during the week and usually grabbed a Pop-Tart or a toaster strudel. Do you remember those toaster strudels? I love toaster strudels. Oh my gosh. They're so messy though. They get all over your fingers. Do they even still make those? Yes, they still make those. Shout out to the toaster strudel. I remember putting those things in the toaster and then putting that icing oh, on Oh, it's that. so good. Oh my God. So good. Yes. <laughs> they were so good. Yes. So we would grab something like that in the morning. And I remember, I think that mom would cook eggs and stuff sometime on the weekends, but my mom was a single mom. And so we ate a decent number of frozen dinners, um, but she was also a good cook and would make like a big chicken and rice casserole or meatloaf. Uh, We had those. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Loved it. And we typically ate dinner in front of the TV together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, Did you have a TV tray? Oh, I love the TV trays. We did have TV trays. I love the TV trays. Yes. So hilariously, we're sitting in the podcast studio, which is also my office, and Jeremy and I sometimes come in here to eat dinner, like when we just want to break from the kids, because there's a TV in here. Yes. And he's like, Kate, we need TV trays. And I'm like, dog, I am not. Father's Day. No, rude. I am not putting TV trays in my office. Yes, you are. It's like a a reminiscing of your childhood. Will not do it. I got to find some bougie alternative. I am not putting TV trays. Oh, you're about to get a gift from the Rebecca Bradford. I'm going to help Jeremy out and get you some TV trays. That's so rude. So we used to have some of those, Jeremy and I, when we were first married. Yes. You know, they're, they're on that little caddy. Oh, my gosh. Did you register for those? I'm thinking back. Like, did we I register we for registered. TV trays? I just think we realized, oh, we're going to eat dinner in front of the TV, and we need these yes. things. We used the coffee table. Greg and I, when we were first married, would make a big dish of seven-layer dip. Oh. And we would sit down at the coffee table to watch a show and eat our seven-layer dip. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's kind of weird when it's, you know, just the two of you, and you're just, like, having dinner together. I mean, it's like, why not just watch a show? That's right. Let's do it. Okay. Um, So my mom has always had a pretty healthy relationship with food. She eats when she's hungry, stops when she's full. She eats sweets when she wants them, but it's, you know, not over the top. 
But the situation with my dad was very different. And I didn't realize it as a kid. It took until I became an adult and could see it with adult eyes. But he has always struggled, struggled with disordered eating. And he would admit that today. He puts a high premium on self-control, eating as little as possible, and always being thin. And he would make jokes about my weight as a kiddo and tell me when I needed to pass on dessert. And so some of those messages, you know, were were entrenched in me from a very young age with with rules about food, you know, especially as a little girl who wanted to please her daddy. Um, those those messages became ingrained before I realized that they were there. You know, it wasn't until I got older and started acting out that I thought, uh oh, something got something yes. went awry here. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So. Um, you know, then later on in my life, I started to struggle with my weight. Has that ever been a struggle for you? I remember middle school and high school. I don't know why, but I had like an order in my head in our group of friends, like who was the thinnest. Okay. And I was not. Okay. So I was definitely not the thinnest, but I, I even know their names today. I okay. know the names of the girls that were thinner than me. I don't know that I felt like I had to diet at that point and change my body. I just felt like I was almost confused. Like, why was it so easy for some girls to be super thin, and why was it not as easy for other girls? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I remember having those thoughts for sure. Okay, wow, very interesting. So I struggled, I started struggling with my weight in fourth grade. Oh, that's so young. And remember starting to eat rice cakes and drink Slim Fast around that time. Wow. Uh, and, you know, there were so many things that led to my struggle with weight and food, one hard thing is that my little sister is naturally one of those girls that you're talking about. Yes. She's naturally very thin. Um, and that's not how God created me. Right. He gave me this hourglass type figure that my husband really appreciates. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, I think so many of us, we prize that that kind of a different body type. You know, the, the really, um, she's just always been very slender. And so that contributed a bit to my issues growing up because I think you compare yourself to your sister. For sure. And my dad, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm telling you this because this is part of my story, but my dad would say, Kate, picking up your sister is like picking up a bag of feathers and picking up you is like picking up a bag of bricks. <gasps> and that oh. was just one of those things, you know, that yes. just stuck in me of like, what is wrong with me? You yes. know, what is wrong with me? Why am I heavier than she is? What am I doing wrong? And how can I fix it? Yes. You know? Well, and I want to say, like, just when you said that, even today in my parenting, raising three kids, uh -huh. I look at other people's kids. Mm. And when I'm around them, I've thought those things. Wow, they're so light. Mm. Wow. Mine are not so light. <laughs> like, just as a shout out to your dad, I mean, that's not, that's not just his thoughts. I think no. lots of people have those thoughts. Yes, yes. And I think even as parents, we find ourselves comparing our kids compare. to other people's kids. Yeah, we yeah. do compare. And even in your own family, you may have kids that, and, and you know, some of that is just genetic. It is. Um, they... They, so you may have a kid that can eat anything all the time and, you know, they stay a certain weight and you have another kid who they just, it's just different for them. Right. And I was the kid who it just was different for me, you know, um, where my sister literally, I mean, she, she could, she ate cookies all day, this little girl. And I, that just wasn't my story. I couldn't, right. I couldn't be that way and have that kind of body type. And so, so that was tough for me. So I was certainly absorbing, you know, my dad's unhealthy behaviors and attitudes toward food and wanted so badly for him to praise me for being thin. And as a high school senior, I did get very thin. And I had one of those moments like you talked about. I was a junior in high school and I, um, my friends and I had taken a picture before a pep rally. I can see it so clearly in my head. And I got the picture developed because that's what we used to do. Ooh, yeah, we did. <laughs> we took that roll of film down to the Walmarts, <laughs> got our pictures developed. And I got the picture back and I looked at the lineup of my friends and I went oh my goodness I am the biggest of the group yeah and I remember determining on that day I will not be that way it was this very some of those unhealthy things that have been entrenched in me yes just locked hold right there yes and so then from there I developed a pretty serious eating disorder um, because I just wanted so badly so badly to be thin, so badly for, I wanted his approval. Can I ask you a question? I'm always yeah. curious about this. How did you know 
to change that? Like, how did you create that eating disorder? I'm always curious if girls, if it's just innate within us that we start making choices that are different, or if we research it to figure out like what contributes to that idea. Okay, well, I'm just going to control this eating and it's going to change my body. Yeah, I think, you know, that's very interesting. I think I had heard other people talk about what had worked for them. Okay. Um, You know, even in high school, girls are talking about, you know, this kind of diet or this kind of diet or I eat this much or this is my workout, you know? Yes. And I think I was paying attention to those things and figured out, okay, this is what I can do to lose weight. And, you know, even more than that, just knowing, hey, if I don't eat, I'm going to lose weight. Right. And wanting it so badly that, that I just started doing those things, even though I think I knew, you know, it wasn't good. Um, I think that's the same today though. Cause I feel like with social media, that's what we're doing. We're yeah. seeing other people post about what worked for them. Yeah. And then we're trying all the different things yeah. because somebody else said, just like what you said, you overhear somebody else say, this yeah. is what worked for me. Yeah. Let me tell you what I didn't do. I didn't go to God and say, God, how do you want me to eat food? Right. How do you want me to see my body? Did not. Right. right. Completely bypass that very important step. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and went straight to what I could control and what I could do. Ah, well, we do that today. We yeah. bypass God all the time. Yeah. So I'm so thankful to tell you that I got help. And I have not struggled in the same way since. But man, did it make that last year of high school and those first couple years of college hard, hard. And, you know, since then, I've been on a journey to have a healthy relationship with food and my body. But there have been lots of ups and downs. And I hated that a new layer of of this that I had to work through reared its head in the pandemic. Yes. It was the pandemic that exposed, uh uh-oh, I have something else to work on here. Yeah. Um, And had to go to my counselor and say, hey, I... This food struggle is coming up again. Um, I didn't realize maybe that I was anxious and stuff during the pandemic, but maybe when things in the world seemed out of control, it was something that I could control or find comfort in. For sure. And so I've had to do the work again 20 years later of having to kind of look through some of those things and just peel off a new layer for freedom. Right. Definitely. Um, So... You know, I've had I've had to do a lot of retooling in my mind about just those things that you got to grow up with a healthy relationship with food and like I don't know, we get to eat all kinds of things and enjoy all, I've always had all these rules about food, yes, you know? Yes. And so I I've, I've had to work to find so much more freedom there and I've had to learn that it's okay for me to be flat worn out and tell Jeremy, "I need you to go get me some Chick-fil-A." And fill up my belly, and then I just get to rest. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. And I think about Elijah, and I love that you taught that at the Gather event in 2020 about Elijah and how he was flat worn out, and he met with God under that broom tree. And God could have done a million different things, but what God did for him is he gave him a meal, and he gave him rest. And sometimes that that food, you know, is that... When we are just at the breaking point, we need a good meal and yes. we need to be able to rest. And that's good. For, and it's from God. Well, and we see that with our kiddos when they're losing their ever loving mind. Yeah. And you're like, you know what? You just need to eat, child. Yes. You need to eat and take a nap. Yes. And then we're all going to be better. Yes. And it's the same thing with us, too. I just, we, our bodies are so going all the time. Um, and I think we have to listen to our bodies when yeah. it says something to us and it says my stomach is grumbling. I need some energy. Give me some food. Right. Agree. So do you have, you know, for me, it's Chick-fil-A or, you know, when I'm feeling, when I'm like, you know what? The world seems like a bad place. I need a turtle Sunday <laughs> from Culver's. <laughs> do you have, what is your go-to? Like, you know, the world is just too much. I just want to eat this thing. Listen, anybody that knows Rebecca Bradford or has spent time with me knows that I have an intense love for the cheese ball. For the cheese ball. I adore cheese balls. And listen, I'm going to be real specific with you people. I like a planter's cheese ball. Yeah. I'm so sorry, Target and Walmart, with your large jumbo packs of generic cheese balls. Yeah. But if I'm going to spend my calories, I'm going to spend them on a planter's. Okay. So planter's comes in the can. And you have to tear off the seal because those things are, I don't know, they could probably last for 30, 40, 50 years with that seal on. (laughs) 
So you tear off the seal, and then it is just sheer cheese grease. I mean, it, there's there can be nothing okay, healthy see, in that. Okay, see, this is good for me to know, because I've bought you cheese balls before in that huge tub. You have. And I didn't You're know not the only one. <laughs> that you were, that it was very planter spe- specific. I actually will eat those, because <laughs> I love all cheese balls, but... I, you know, it's so funny. The older you get, the more you're like, okay, I, I just can't be wasting my time on this other stuff, people. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm going to need a real Dr. Pepper, <laughs> no diet, and I'm going to need a planter's cheese ball. And that's going to make it. my life so much better. I love that. Okay, that's good for me to know. Well, and we've always joked, I love that the cheese ball is your go-to food because you are a cheese ball. I am. It's like, I love cheesy things. It's a match made in I love heaven. cheesy jokes. <laughs> I love all of it. I need to dress up as a cheese ball for Halloween one year. I feel like that would just be so appropriate. It would be very appropriate. Okay, it's, I'm working on, on it, people. Y'all hold on. I'm a work on Many levels. It. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so now that we've kind of looked back on our own childhoods and, you know, what that was like growing up, I want us to talk a little bit about what food is like in our homes. You know, like what is what is the food culture in your home? So I feel like you do, Becca, such a good job of making only one meal that the whole family eats. I thought about this the other night with you because I thought about you when you tell me, you're like, I make two meals. I make one for me and Jeremy, and then I make one for the kids. I don't got time for that. Girl, I know it's wrong. We got to eat what I'm cooking. You know, so how how did you implement that? I, I mean, honestly, my dad used to tell me when my kids were little, don't give them choices. <laughs> okay. Like, you just put food in front of them and say, this is what we're having. Okay. And if they don't like it, then you ask them to eat a few bites. And that's fine. But um, I really think, you know, and they did that with us. We did not have choices. Okay. We we ate whatever mom put in front of us. Okay. I do think it depends on the kid, too. I think I just have kids that really like all kinds of foods. Okay. You know, so we just didn't struggle with that so much. But I like to tell new mamas, (laughs) sorry that you're sitting across from me, don't do that. Don't start that in your home because what you're teaching your kids is you can have whatever you want. Yeah. Because I'm going to cater to you. And that's right. not bad for special occasions and stuff. But I really think the rest of your life, you're going to go to dinner parties and be with people where you're going to have to eat things you don't love. So you yeah. need to learn how to either eat a couple bites or work around that. So I always tell new moms, hey, you know what? If you're going somewhere out to eat, just order it for them and say, here we go. Uh, you know, I agree. I think looking back, if I could do that differently, I would. I And I think part of what contributed to it for us was that my first two kiddos had food allergies. Yes, I think that does make a big difference. Yeah, and so I had to be very specific. You know, there was kind of a, a so just foods I knew were safe and that they would eat. And, and that created kind of that from the beginning. But with Caroline, our third kid, we did exactly what you just said. We just gave her everything. And she eats everything. Yes. You know? Um, And so I would say as much as possible that, you know, if you are starting that journey, that food journey with your kids, just give them everything, like Rebecca said, if possible. There are kids who have food sensitivities. There are allergies. And, you know, I don't think – one of the things my parents did say to me is, you know, you don't want to make dinner time a battle where it's unenjoyable for everyone. Right. Right. So figure out where that medium is for you. You know, if it's, okay, whatever we're eating, you have to try two bites or, you know, whatever your rules are. Um, But you don't, right, you just don't want to be fighting at every meal. And we did have one kid that does not love all the things Uh and we did definitely battled with him. So we didn't have like, you know, this family of like kids that would eat anything. We, we definitely battled with him. Okay. Um, and I do think even today I'll make something and he'll come in the kitchen and he's not excited about what I've made. Yeah. Um, and so I know that I know that when I'm making it. And yeah. so I might try and tweak the recipe a little bit in such a way that it would help him. Okay. So I think as moms, we definitely can do that. Yeah, but, I like that. But I also think we have to remember, too, because I'm an adult, I can go get whatever I want to eat during the day. Uh-huh. I mean, bless my heart, I get to choose yeah. what I want. Yeah. So I do think it's important to let your kids have some choices, too. Well, and I like what you're saying. I think, yeah, you know, try. we can keep them in mind. Yes. Um. You know, but for us, yeah, I, I've got to figure out how to get out of this routine where I'm making a meal for Jeremy and I and then but I mean really now we're at the point the kids make their own meal we're in the kitchen together I'm making the dinner and there's overlap it's not like they're two separate meals for the most part and there are plenty of meals now I've because I've been working on this there are a lot of meals that we eat all together but there are sometimes like 
the kids don't like chili or, you know, there's uh-huh. certain soups they don't like or spicy things. So if I'm making that that night, then I'll say, okay, if y'all want to cook your own dinner and then they come in and they're cooking with me. Yes. So anyway, we're, we're trying to move forward in that. Um, but like I said, if I could go back and kind of, you know, go from a different perspective, that's what I would say to a young mama is just to try and get yes. to eat all the things. Yes. Well, and I'll say this. I think I grew up with a very healthy perspective of food. I think becoming a mom and having kids, I almost tweaked that in the negative way. Okay. And I feel like I've become over conscious okay. with what my kids eat. Okay. I don't let them have sodas okay. all the time. And we don't eat a lot of candy in our house. Yeah. And we are really cognizant of second serving and uh-huh. third servings, uh-huh. I do think in a sense, I have not necessarily implemented all the great things my parents did wow, with me interesting. now that I'm a mom. Okay. Just because of what we talked about, the comparison trap. Yeah. And because I've been in student ministry so long and I see what happens to yeah. kids, uh-huh. I don't know. I feel like I'm even overly conscious of it almost trying to protect my kids from having to experience some of those things. Yeah. But honestly, having to remind myself, God made their body. Yeah. I I mean, yes, I carried them in my stomach for nine months, but God created their DNA. And so just like you said, sometimes somebody is just more prone to being a slender build. Right. And somebody's more prone to being a not slender build. Yeah. So. Well, and that, that even may change as they get bigger. Yes. Right. As they grow up, we see their bodies change in all kinds of ways. Yes. Um, So I think that's interesting and very transparent for you to say that. So talk about breakfast, because I have this in my mind that you make breakfast every morning. Oh, you're so sweet to think that. You don't? I thought you did. My kid has the star test today, so I did actually get up and make him eggs and sausage and toast. um, Which Greg came in the kitchen and he was like, whoa, (laughs) you're like starting the mom day off, killing it. And I was like, listen, y'all don't get excited about this. No, we do lots of cereal. We love Pop-Tarts. Okay. Um, I... We have Spark at our house. Yeah. It's our little energy drink. Yeah. I let my 12-year-old, I was like, you had taken the star today. Let's have some Spark. Get that brain moving. Fantastic. No, I am not cooking breakfast every morning, for okay. sure. Okay, for some reason, yeah. I pictured you, like, getting up and making a hot breakfast. I don't know why. I mean, I'm getting up with them and helping them find their breakfast. But, no, it's a big deal when mom, like, makes eggs and bacon. Yeah. You know, there's something happening that day that's important. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, mornings are not my strong suit. <laughs> Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy is the morning parent. So in my house, they fix themselves yogurt, Cheerios with fruit, or Caleb just, he usually drinks a protein shake. Yes. My kids just are not big breakfast eaters. Yeah. I'm not a big breakfast eater. And Jeremy had to adjust because breakfast is his favorite meal. And growing up, his mom made them a big home-cooked breakfast every morning. (gasps) Did she really? Listen, Mimi is like, she don't play. Wow. That woman can cook, and she made them big meals every day. And they always had bread and always had dessert. So then when I married him, and I'm just making this meal with, like, you know, a piece of meat and some vegetables, he's like, excuse me? (laughs) That is so funny you said that because I think bread and dessert are, like, the bougie extras to a meal. Yes. So there are times where I don't have a bread. Yeah. Her. And my kids are like, where's the, and I'm like, listen, you don't have to have bread every meal. Right. People. Right. What are we doing? No. But when I do, you know, like sometimes I'm at Costco and I'll see like the pack of crescent rolls and I'm like, Ooh, these kids are going to love me. Oh, that'd be so excited. My kids do not like crescent rolls. <gasps> they don't. They don't. Okay. Our sister Schubert. Do y'all like those? Take, bring me the sister Schubert yeah. all day long. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So for us having bread, Bread with a meal is a treat. Yes. So when when I do serve them, they're like, what? Whoa. And then what we, are we celebrating? Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, dessert is kind of like, we just generally don't, you know. And so. Well, and kids, I say that in my house too. I'm like, we don't get dessert every night. This no. is not like just part of the thing. Right. This is special. Yeah. So that was a big adjustment for Jeremy because he was like, excuse me. And even now. That's like part, it's like part of his, we'll finish dinner and he's like, he just needs like a piece of chocolate yes. or sometimes he'll eat like a spoonful of peanut butter. He yes. just needs like something sweet. It's like built into him. But is that something in our body? Like, is our body <laughs> craving it? Do our cells need it to function? Yeah, I What's don't know. What's up with that? No, and I don't think there's anything wrong, you know, with having a dessert. We just don't want to get on that runaway train, right? Yes, yes. We want to have those things in moderation. So my point in bringing all that up is that there's a bunch of ways to do it. Like we just talked yes. about. And you will probably go through different seasons where meals look differently at yes. your house. And that's okay. Yes. You know, when our kids were really little, we did 
we did kind of eat dinner together. But even then, a lot of times when they were babies, I was feeding them first. We were putting them down and then Jeremy and I were eating, right? Yes. Or then when they were little and everybody could kind of eat at the same time, we were sitting at the table a lot. Now that we're gone and stuff in the evenings, we have family dinner. We try and have family dinner where we're sitting around the table three times a week. That's great. That's an awesome goal. But then other nights, they love it when because they come into the kitchen. They're like, "Is it family dinner?" And I'm like, "No." And they're like, "Yes," because the kids will My sit kids and watch get a excited show. too. Yes, they totally do. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, and as your schedule changes, you know, we're entering that new phase with a high schooler and a middle schooler. They've got practice. They've exactly. got games. Yeah. I mean, it, mamas, it gets tricky yeah. to try and figure out how to feed your family family, healthy meals. Right. We are not doing it perfect over here. We right. really are just like learning as we go. Right. And it's, it's just going to change. So what I would love for us to talk about today is the messages I want to make sure we are sending to ourselves and our homes. I want to make sure that those are on track with what the Bible says about food. And many of these will stand in opposition to what our American culture and especially the diet culture says about food. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about that. The first thing I want to address is our use of words like good and bad, clean and unclean, junk food, and even cheat day. Because these terms about food come from our culture and not from the Bible. So I want us to look about what the Bible says to this in response. And this comes from 1 Timothy 4, 1-4. through I'm going to read this whole section because I think it gives you some context to why I'm going to pick out this particular verse. Uh, But this is Paul writing to Timothy and, and to his church. And he says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So this is just basically false teaching is going to happen. Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. I don't know if I've ever heard that verse before. That is so good. So good. And, you know, they're in the middle. I mean, they're talking here about food. And one of the issues for the New Testament believers is they have these struggles about food and the rules around food. Because if you remember, in the Old Testament, Jews were not allowed to eat certain foods like pork and things. And... But in Christ, those restrictions were no longer necessary. And so there were different areas like circumcision and with food and stuff where as these believers in Christ were coming out of this Jewish tradition, there were some hiccups for them on what was right, right? And you might even remember that God met Peter in the upper room and he descended that blanket with all the foods and he told him that no foods were unclean. That's right. And, but that was even hard for Peter to get there. And it was hard for these Christians because, because of the foods that had been allowed and not allowed. And Paul is trying to tell him, Hey, listen, God created all all of these things and they are to be received with Thanksgiving. And we don't need to have these rules about food anymore. Isn't that incredible? I feel like our culture has a billion rules about food. A billion. Yes. Yes. And that stands in stark contrast to what the Bible said. So this actually comes up a lot in the New Testament. And so Paul, later he's talking to the Romans, and they had been judging each other based on what they ate. And this is in Romans 14, 20. And Paul says, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. So basically, Paul is teaching them, listen, if someone else has, because they were having these issues where someone was stumbling, they were, they were getting out of whack with the faith because someone else was expressing their food freedom. So he was saying, listen, if that makes it more comfortable for them, for you to eat the way they feel comfortable, then you can do that when they're in, when you're in their presence. But otherwise, you just need to know that all these foods are clean and good right? Yes. There's nothing, we talk about eating clean. Those are clean foods, right? I'm going to eat clean this week. Listen, the only thing I think is clean is water. Okay. (laughs) That's it. That's the only clean food. But that's like, that's like a tag word in our culture right now. Yes. Something we use about food. Yes. And the Bible clearly says there are no foods that are not clean. They are all to be received with thanksgiving and everything is indeed clean. That's what Paul just said. And the same argument, 
Let me tell you, frankly, until I started studying this, I didn't realize really how many times it comes up. But Paul is having to address this with many groups of people. And I feel like he would have to come and address this with many groups of people with us, right? Yes. Okay, so he's then it it comes up again when he's talking to the Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul tells the people this in verse 23. He says, everything is permissible, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. So he's talking about food that's in the context again there. And that was in the um, Holman Christian Standard Edition. And it says this again in NIV. It says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. So that is the freedom that we have. Moms, we actually can do anything, right? There's nothing that is off limits. Right. The better question to ask ourselves is, is it helpful? Is it constructive? Is it building us up? Right? That's a great question. Not, this is off bounds or I can't have this, right? We can receive all things he made with Thanksgiving and enjoy them. And when we walk in that freedom, we are building up the body of Christ. We help build others up so that they can be free. Because he goes on to say, this is how he, he ends this this first Corinthians segment where Paul is talking in verse 31, he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. This is, we are to receive these things with thanksgiving and use it to glorify God. What do you think about when you hear those verses and thinking about our food? Uh, I definitely think it changes the way that you look at things. I think we're reminding ourselves that the things that God created are good yeah. and that we as humans have put our own restrictions, just like the people in the Bible did, yeah. kind of saying this is okay and this is not okay. Right. And then what happens is just what uh, Paul and Peter were saying, or whichever, was it Peter? Yeah. That you then begin influencing those people around you uh-huh. by the human standards that you've put on it. Yeah. And as moms, I have a house full of kiddos that yeah. are coming up underneath me that are watching me and listening to me and yeah. picking up cues for me. Yes. What cues am I laying down? Uh-huh. Because one day they're going to have their own home and are they going to do those same things? Or are they going to just have this subconscious belief inside of them that this food is okay and this is not? Yeah. Or it's okay to eat like this and it's not okay to eat like that? Yeah. Very good. So... Paul, in earlier in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about sexual immorality and food. And he uses that same language that I just shared with you about all things are permissible. And he says it again. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And other versions say, I will not be mastered by mm, anything. Yeah, that's, what, that's the way I remember it. And so I think that's a better test for us with food. That when we look at the Bible and realize that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, which just take a pause on that. I think we take that for granted. Yes. You know that if you ever read the Old Testament and you read about God setting up the temple and that that's where his spirit dwelled and it was this holy special thing, that to know that now... We are the walking around temple of the Holy God whose spirit lives inside of us. Yes. And that's why we want to take care of our bodies, right? Yes. So that they're strong and energetic and healthy and can be used for his glory. Um, And so we can consider, then we can consider, okay, are there certain foods that are more addictive, right? And that can have mastery over us. So there are certain foods, you know, like it's proven that sugar can be very addictive and it can have mastery over us. And sometimes we go through phases where you might feel like, oh, that sugar monster is calling the shots. Yes. And so we might say, okay, this is getting mastery over me. God, would you help you be the only thing that's in control of my body? Yes. Or it can be caffeine or it can be Chick-fil-A, man, whatever they are putting. I know that's God's chicken, but listen, (laughs) whatever they are putting in that stuff, you just like Chick-fil-A, she calling you out. She's saying you're putting something inside that chicken that's making what her come back. Is it? But you might say, you know what, I am really craving fried foods all the time, and that might have mastery over me. So what do I need to consider here? Is this something where God needs to say, hey, that has gotten mastery. I need to have mastery Listen, over Listen, for me, it's Chewies. Give me an is enchilada. <laughs> I mean, I'll eat that every day. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Don't build one of those in my hometown, please. Oh, I can will you go imagine? There. Rebecca, I would go there all the time. Oh, it would I'd be, be killer. Broke. I'd be broke at eating enchiladas every day. It would be killer. Okay, so let me make this caveat because you may be listening to this and you are feeling like I'm seeming hypocritical because I just told you guys a few episodes ago that we were doing a 21-day food <laughs> cleanse. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so you may be saying, Kate, uh, this is rude because you're telling us not to do the thing that you are doing. So let me tell you this. One of the things that that preempted for us, and this is called a 21-day food cleanse. I wish there was another word. Um, but basically, that came about because Jeremy and I realized that there were some foods that had mastery over us, that we were craving things that as we ate them more and more, we were feeling sluggish. We were feeling not our most effective selves, right? Yes. And so we needed to step away from all of those things and take a break so that we could kind of get back in tune with our body's natural cravings and things and make sure that we were legitimately meeting a need from God in a legitimate way and not in an illegitimate way, right? Yes. By turning to yes. food when we maybe should be turning to God. Yes. So in my own life, I love Dr. Pepper. I've loved it my whole life. And I, for the last month, have not had Dr. Pepper. Wow. And I made that choice for selfish reasons uh-huh. because it's almost summer. Uh-huh. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I drink enough of this yeah. that if I stop drinking it, I yeah. would drop a few pounds. But the Lord has totally shown me, Rebecca, you actually just feel better. Wow. Your body functions better yeah. without the caffeine and the sweet. Yeah. And the sugar. And I have so much more energy. I yeah. don't lose my energy in the afternoon like I used to. Yeah. When I feel that craving for a Dr. Pepper, it really does remind me, listen, you're going to the wrong place for satisfaction right now. Okay. Like it has been, I hate to say it's a spiritual experience, but God has used it to teach me something spiritual. I love that. That by giving something up that had mastery over me, yeah. I have found new freedom. And I have made better choices because when you start making healthy choices, you want to make more healthy choices. Agree. I love that. That's so good. Okay. Here is the general food, the general truth about food that I would love for us to live out and teach our children. Do you know, God was the first one to come up with the concept of a fuel tank and indicating whether it was full or empty. All right. These people that put these in these cars, they got this from God. Here's what I mean. When your car, when it gets low on fuel, a light comes on and tells you you need to refuel. So you go to the gas station, you fill up, and then you can run it again until it tells you that it's going toward empty. And God created our bodies the same way with an internal fuel light. When we are running low on fuel, he created our bodies to tell us so. You get hunger pains. You start feeling lethargic. You may get hangry, right? Hangry. That's a word <laughs> in our house. So we fuel up. And then we have the energy we need to go again. And when our fuel gets low, we get an indication and can refuel. The problem so many of us are experiencing is that we are just not listening to the God-given indications he has given us on when to refuel and when to stop refueling. That's right. Right? We are topping off the tank. Yes. To overfill and it's spill over. Yes. Right? Yes. That sure tastes good. Well, but it gets our <laughs> bodies out of whack, it right? Does. It does. And just like if we want our cars to run the most efficiently, we need to give it the good fuel, right? Yes. Not fuel that has a bunch of toxins and stuff in it, yes, right? We want to yes. give it that whatever that, I don't know, you know, they have all these names for come get this type of fuel, you know. You mean unleaded? Well, but sometimes it'll say like it has special things in it. You Listen, know? they try to get your money, them yeah. additives, yeah. don't do the it. Additives, yeah. No, yeah. yes. But when we fill our body, when we listen, because I think that's just a lot of us who have disordered eating issues, we've gotten things out of order. And the truth is, is that God put in you the order. He gave us these indicators to tell us when we're hungry and when we're full. And we can listen to those and we can teach our kiddos to listen to those. I have one kiddo who he is very scheduled. And, you know, like in the summer, especially this happens. And I'll say, okay, are you guys ready for lunch? And he'll say, well, is it 12 o'clock? And I'm like, it does not matter if right. it's 12 o'clock. Right. Are you hungry? right? Because it, it's not about, that's a food rule he has placed on himself that he can't eat or until a certain time. Wow. And so, but I think we do that in a myriad of different ways. For sure. And, but when we live that way, then we understand at certain times of the month for women, especially you're going to need more fuel in that tank. Yes. Yes. And you better not be trying to deprive yourself or someone in your house might get murdered. <laughs> And so, you know, just being aware and, and all kinds of full fuel are acceptable. So have you ever thought about your body as a fuel tank? What do you think about that? No, I, I, I guess I've thought about it in that regard for sleep or for exercise. I okay. guess I've never really thought about that God created 
that. He put that inside of me. He gave me the tools I needed to know when my fuel tank was empty and that when I'm choosing to fill it at a time of the day that I'm not hungry, I am spilling over. Mm. I'm giving my body things that it doesn't necessarily need in that moment. Yeah. And not that you can't do that all the time when you're celebrating or doing something special, but like when I make healthy choices to fill my tank at the right time, it not only impacts me, it impacts those people around me. Yeah. Because I'm reacting to them now in a healthy manner too. Yeah. Our American culture is obsessed, I mean obsessed, with foods and diets and restrictions and weight. But I hope that we've seen today in the scripture that that stands in stark contrast to what God says about food. And I mean, we could do a whole nother episode about what he says about weight and image and the things he cares about. Yes. I want us to be moms who speak kingdom culture about food and weight and body image in our homes instead of American culture. Because if we speak these American culture ideas, my goodness, we are putting our kids in bondage, you know, we are setting them up to live as slaves when we could set them up to live in freedom. And so I hope that, you know, as we talk about this, that we would just consider the language we're using around food, um, kind of how we help encourage our kids to pay attention to their natural God-given hunger, that they would listen to those cues and go along with them. And that, that we would just kind of watch how we talk about things and, let our kids know that all things are acceptable and we just don't want anything to have mastery over us besides the Holy Spirit. Well, and that we're putting in them something that's going to hopefully be something that lasts their lifetime. Their lifetime. That just like we would teach them about technology and we yeah. would teach them about prayer and we would teach them about sleep. I mean, all those things yeah. that this is just as important, if not more important, because it's something we do three times a day. I, you know, and that's the thing about food. That's what one of the things that was hard with for me with an eating disorder is because I had to face it every day. You know, you yes. have to have it to live. Yes. And so if we're going to be facing this multiple times a day, man, let's face it with confidence yes. and with truth and um, with thankfulness because God gave us these things to be enjoyed. Well, and it's funny that you say thankfulness right there at the end, because isn't that what we do before a meal? Yes. We stop and give thanks. Stop and give thanks. And we tell God that we're so grateful that he gave us the means to have the food and that we can have something that we enjoy to put in our bodies. Yes. It's a great way. Moms, we are so thankful that you are here, and we are so thankful um, for the way that you've been supporting us. If Gather Moms podcast, if this has been a blessing to you, would you consider supporting us financially? You can go to patreon.com slash gather moms and select to give five, 10 or $20 a month to help us. When you do that, you are helping us create, hire, promote, connect, resource, encourage mamas. And we need you to be able to do the things that God has called us to do. So today, would you consider doing that and supporting us in that way? We so appreciate that you give your time to us to listen in. We want you to know that we are going to God on your behalf and asking him, what do we need to share with our mamas today? And just before this episode, Kate and I prayed and we just asked God to be a part of our words today because we wanted everything we said to be honoring to him. So just know that we care about you so much and we are spending extra time to make sure that what we give you is God honoring. That's right. We love you so much, moms, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. 